Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. Today we're going to be talking about polar molecules. A polar molecule is one in which there's an uneven distribution of electrons in a bond. And that's due to a difference in electronegativity in the atoms. So if you look at this compound of boron and fluorine down below, you might remember that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. And that means it pulls electrons in this bond here towards it. So it gets a partially negative sign, which we can represent with a delta. Let me redraw that so it's not such an ugly delta. Still ugly, a little better. So fluorine's a little negative. Boron, on the other hand, is a little positive. And so that means that we have an uneven distribution of charge. Fluorine has more of the electrons from that bond than boron does. And when that happens, we say that the molecule has a dipole moment, and we represent that with this arrow here. So that's what we call a dipole. We call it a dipole because there's two poles, a negative one and a positive one. And if a molecule has a net dipole moment, then it's polar. It requires a polar bond because a polar bond gives you the uneven distribution to begin with. So if you don't have polar bonds, you definitely don't have a polar molecule. If you have polar bonds, you might have a polar molecule. In the case of diatomic molecules like BF here, you are always going to have a polar molecule if you have a polar bond. Things get a little more complicated, though, if we get to uh, molecules with multiple atoms. So, for example, let's look at our CO2. Oxygen's more electronegative, and that means it's a little negative. And carbon's a little uh, less electronegative, so it means it's a little positive. So we have two dipole moments, one going to the right, boop, and one going to the left. Now imagine those right and left arrows as fighting, right? And they're exactly the same length, and they're pulling the charge with exactly the same force. And so that means those dipole moments cancel out, and on the whole, CO2 does not have a dipole moment. So even though those are polar bonds, they cancel out because the molecule is symmetric. And that's going to be an important point. So this guy is symmetric, and that's why it cancels out the dipole moment. So it's not polar. On the other hand, if we look at water over here, oxygen's a little negative, hydrogen's a little positive, and if I think about adding those arrows, well, they're both pulling up. So imagine the arrows like being ropes pulling on a box or something, right? And if I'm pulling both the hydrogens up and towards the center, well, they're both going to lift up, right? On the other hand, in the CO2 case, if I'm pulling ropes apart from each other, I'm going to hold whatever's in the middle right in the middle. So think of this as like a tug of war game, and when we add those arrows together, for the case of water, we lift up the molecule, right? And so this is a polar molecule, and it's also asymmetric. And so this is what you need for a polar molecule. You need a polar bond, at least one, and some asymmetry. So let's take a look at a few examples. What I'm assuming here is that you know how to draw Lewis structures. So if you don't, check out the video I'll link to below to learn how to draw Lewis structures. That's the first thing we need to do when we start our problem, so that's step one down there. And the Lewis structure for methane, CH4, is this guy. Four hydrogens around our carbon. So, the first thing we want to figure out is, do we have a polar bond? Once we draw our Lewis structure, we need to decide, are our bonds polar or nonpolar? And so what we're going to do then is take the difference in their electronegativity. Because remember, it's a difference in electronegativity that draws the electrons more to one side or the other. And so to do that, you're going to need a chart of electronegativities for atoms. I have a little one here. You can find a bigger one online or in your textbook. And also a little guide down here that tells me what the differences in those numbers mean. So when I take the difference, I'm going to compare it to the differences I see in this chart to decide if it's polar or not. So let's go ahead and do that. I only have carbon and hydrogen bonds. So basically, I'm going to take carbon... I'm going to look up its electronegativity value on my little chart. It's 2.5, and I'm going to subtract 2.1. That's the electronegativity value of hydrogen. That gives me 0 0.4. Now, that turns out to be right on the line between pure covalent and polar covalent. CH uh, is considered nonpolar even though it's right on the line. And it's actually a really important case to remember because all of our big organic molecules have a bunch of C and H bonds and those are all nonpolar. So CH is a nonpolar bond. All right, so all of our bonds are nonpolar. So that means it's nonpolar. So remember, step two says, are the bonds nonpolar? And yes, the bonds are nonpolar. That means my whole molecule is nonpolar. So I have a nonpolar molecule. I don't even have to consider if it's symmetric or not. I just know because the bonds are all nonpolar, 
The molecule's nonpolar. There's no initial separation of charge, then there's no separation of charge overall. Let's look at another example. Here we have NH3, which is ammonia. Again, we'll start with drawing the Lewis structure. We're going to need three hydrogens and a lone pair on nitrogen. And now we're going to decide, after we've drawn the Lewis structure, we're going to decide are the bonds polar. So I'm going to do nitrogen minus hydrogen. Nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3, so 3.0 minus my 2.1 for hydrogen. It gives me 0 0.9. Now, notice these are just electronegativity differences, so it doesn't actually matter whether I subtract hydrogen from nitrogen or nitrogen from hydrogen. It's all about the magnitude of that value. So it's 0 0.9, which puts it plainly in the polar covalent range. It's between 0.4 and 1.8. So that means I have polar bonds. Okay, so let's write that down to remember that. My bonds are polar. Now I need to decide, is the molecule symmetric? Well, one thing that's tricky here is you really need to know electron geometry and molecular geometry to do this, to tell if it's symmetric. Uh, you might get the answer right even if you don't know those, but it's best to know those first, so I'll also link to those videos below. But here you can see that my dipole is going to point in towards the nitrogen in each case, but then I have no counterbalancing arrow here, right? There's no arrow up there because there's no bond, and that means there's asymmetry. The hydrogens on the right and left side are pulling in, right? So those may cancel out, but the bottom one is pulling up, and that's not going to cancel out. Further, if you actually look at the geometry here, this is a tetrahedral molecule. It has tetrahedral electron geometry. So what that means is you can sort of picture these hydrogens like a little tripod at the bottom, and they are going to net add together their dipole moment. So since it's an asymmetric molecule, that means we now have a polar molecule. So it's also asymmetric. That means it's polar. Polar molecule. All right, let's do one more. This guy is CH3Cl. Quickly, we'll draw the Lewis structure. Again, I'm drawing this flat, right? But because it has four atoms around it, it's tetrahedral. And after drawing the Lewis structure, we're going to ask, are the bonds polar? Well, we already know the CH bonds, right? We've already told ourselves that those are nonpolar. And it'll be pretty quick that you won't even have to actually calculate these differences to know if they're polar or nonpolar. You'll just remember, oh, CH is nonpolar. Carbon in any halogen is polar. But we'll go ahead and calculate that, right? We also have a carbon-chlorine bond here. So we have to take that into account, too. And carbon, actually, let's reverse the order so we get a positive answer out here. We're going to do chlorine minus carbon. And chlorine is 3, and carbon is 2.5. So we do 3 minus 2.5, and we get 0 0.5. Again, it wouldn't matter if you switched the order you subtracted them in. You'd still get 0 0.5. It would be negative. But this chart is all about the magnitudes. So that puts it in the covalent range, the polar covalent range. So it's just a little polar. Now, let's draw the dipole moment, right? There's not really much of a dipole moment for my carbon hydrogens. Just maybe a little bit. Since they're nonpolar, we can just basically consider there to be no dipole moment there. On the other hand, the carbon-chlorine one, I'm drawing my arrow towards chlorine because chlorine is the more electronegative one, is a, pretty, uh, is a pretty significant arrow upwards. So, all of these bonds are not symmetric. They're different atoms in this case. So if I had all chlorines or all hydrogens, I would actually get a nonpolar molecule because it would be symmetric. In this case, though, it's asymmetric because of the different identities of the atoms. Hydrogen, hydrogen hydrogen chlorine. That means there's a tug-of-war competition, right? But chlorine's way stronger than any of the other teams pulling on the electrons, and that means that this guy is not symmetric, right? It might be tetrahedral, but it has different atoms around it, so it's not symmetric. So we can say that this is asymmetric, and it has a polar bond, so that makes it a polar molecule. So, CH3Cl is a polar molecule. Alright, last one. PF6. When I draw this guy, it's going to look like 
six fluorines around my phosphorus and all of those are going to have a lone pair. Lots of lone pairs. Okay, notice now that I have only phosphorus and fluorine bonds. So I'm going to compare those electronegativity. Fluorine is definitely the most electronegative, so I'm going to do fluorine minus phosphorus values. Uh, fluorine is 4 minus the phosphorus, which is 2.1. That gives me 1.9. Okay, so I have polar bonds. Now I have to ask the question, is it symmetric? And actually, this guy is symmetric. My fluorines exactly cancel out. Again, it's best to picture this as the octahedral molecule it is, where these four fluorines make a square, right? And this fluorine goes up and down. And if we think about drawing all the arrows, the four in the square are going to be pulling equally around the four corners of the square, and the one above and below are going to be pulling equally up and down, and that means that all of those arrows cancel out. So it's actually symmetric. And that means because the molecule is symmetric, yes, it's symmetric, it makes it nonpolar. So there is a nonpolar molecule. Ta-da! So this is the basic way to tell if a molecule is polar or not. We decide if we have a polar bond and if it's symmetric or not. Remember, the two things we need for a polar molecule, at least one polar bond and asymmetry. If we don't have both of those, we have a nonpolar molecule. So thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry. You can add any comments you have below if you have any questions, clarifications. You can subscribe or like or do whatever you want. You can do none of that also. Thanks for watching.